It's a great pleasure to be here as part of the discussions that we're having uh, among revolutionary activists to figure out where we're going from here, where we've been and where we're going. I'm going to give you a dramatic reading of my long talk, and I'm very much looking forward to the discussion. In the first portion of these remarks, I want to explain, first of all, why Leninism is worth talking about, not only for understanding some of what happened in history, but also for helping to change the world in the here and now of the early 21st century. I want to explain what I mean by the term Leninism, then touch on several historical controversies that may shed light on how to make use of this tradition in our ongoing political work. In the second portion of my remarks, I will offer thoughts on ways to apply and contribute to the Leninist tradition in our practical efforts for the coming period. In this particular period of radicalization and ferment, as activists are engaged in sorting through their own experiences, gathering more information about the realities related to those experiences, and engaging with the ideas and examples of revolutionaries who preceded us, a serious engagement with the Leninist tradition will be unavoidable. This is not because this long dead revolutionary can tell us all we need to know about building an organization, a movement, and a set of struggles capable of making a revolution. Lenin and his comrades lived in a very different time, functioned within a political, technological, and cultural context that was dramatically different from ours. And also, Lenin got important things wrong, making mistakes that, unlike us, he can no longer learn from. Serious engagement with Leninism is unavoidable for serious activists because Lenin and his comrades developed an incredibly rich body of thought and experience as they faced the oppression and destructiveness and violence of capitalism. And this thought and experience had a powerful impact for a time in helping the workers and the oppressed to win important victories. Capitalism continues to exist. The working class continues to exist. Various forms of capitalist oppression and destructiveness and violence continue to exist. That is really what the Occupy movement, the Arab Spring, the anti-austerity rebellions, and other insurgencies of our time, including right now in Turkey, are all about. So it makes sense to consider what the Leninist tradition may offer. It has become common among some on the left to contrast Lenin's own thinking uh, to what uh, has come to be known as Leninism. And I want to spend a few minutes on why I don't accept that, that division. Of course, there is more than one version of Leninism. In Joseph Stalin's influential 1924 classic, The Foundations of Leninism, we are told that Leninism, here's a quote, Leninism is Marxism in the era of imperialism and the proletarian revolution. Which means, if you wish to be a genuine Marxist, you cannot question, but only embrace Lenin's ideas. This totalistic formulation is worth contrasting with the quite different formulations of three other prominent comrades of Lenin. Nikolai Bukharin, Gregory Zinoviev, and Leon Trotsky. In his valuable biography of Stalin, Robert C. Tucker indicates that Bukharin and Zinoviev refer to Leninism as Lenin's retrieval of Marx's revolutionary orientation in one case, or his application of Marx's ideas to Russian realities. Trotsky goes so far as to warn that, as Tucker paraphrases it, a dogmatization of Lenin was contrary to the essentially non-doctrinaire, innovative, and critical-minded spirit of Leninism. In contrast, Stalin's Leninism is Marxism formulation presents Lenin's thought as the one true Marxism which could not be questioned. His 1924 booklet provides a condensed systematization 
that was a, catechism in uh, a catechistic in style and authoritarian in tone, as Tucker aptly notes. Related to this whole question, it's worth recalling a very fine uh, 1977 essay um, entitled Stalin, Lenin, and Leninism by the late Valentino Gerratana, an outstanding scholar who did important work on the Italian Marxist Antonio Gramsci, who emphasized that, quote, while he was still alive, Lenin was not regarded as a source of authority even if he possessed considerable personal authority flowing from the quality of his thought and political practice. The construction of an artificial Leninism as a source of authority, which could not be questioned and thereby greatly empowered those claiming to represent it, was carried out most successfully and destructively by Stalin, whose dictatorship destroyed Leninism under the banner of Leninism, to quote one of his fiercest critics, uh, someone you may not have heard of. He was a dissident communist, M. N. Ryutin, uh, and he was writing in the early 1930s. Gerratana reflected, the reduction of Lenin's thought to a systematic, concentrated form and the construction of a finished theoretical system involved not only the exclusion of everything that was considered accidental to the development of his thought, but also the separation of the end result with the process that generated it from the oscillations, approximations, mistakes, and corrections essential to the process itself. Moreover, it should be realized that the process remained incomplete and was cut short at a moment of profound intellectual tension when Lenin was searching with difficulty for a new way forward. Thus, the whole project of his successors who constructed this artificial Leninism was from the start based on a mystification. This is Gerratana speaking. Lenin was influenced by other thinkers. He was very much part of what Lars Lee has called the best of second international Marxism. The so-called Leninism of closed Finnish dogmas was incompatible with Lenin's entire approach to politics. But it can be argued that he helped generate a distinctive political approach and body of thought. For the sake of brevity, one could refer to a genuine Leninism to which it is worth giving attention. Lenin's quite unoriginal starting point, shared with Karl Marx, Karl Kautsky, Rosa Luxemburg, and others, is a belief in the, ne the necessary interconnection of socialist theory and practice with the working class and labor movement. The working class cannot adequately defend its actual interests and overcome its oppression, in his view, without embracing the goal of socialism an economic system in which the economy is socially owned, democratically controlled, in order to meet the needs of all people. This fundamental orientation is the basis for most of what Lenin has to say, that is socialism and the working class coming together. That's the basis for most of what he has to say. And taken together, that constitutes the Leninism of Lenin. The scope of his political thought is something I attempted to convey in my collection of his writings that was referred to, Revolution, Democracy, Socialism. It embraces various aspects of the labor movement, class consciousness and culture, trade unions, social movements for reforms, the relationship of reform to revolution, electoral struggles, dynamics of party building, united front coalitions, class alliances, especially the worker-peasant alliance, the interplay of democratic and social, socialist struggles, questions of nationalism and imperialism, ways of utilizing Marxist theory and more. All of this is part of Leninism. At certain points, Lenin's utilization of Marxism was different from some of what passed for Marxism among a majority of the world's socialists by 1919, when the Communist International was formed. What distinguished Lenin's Bolsheviks from many others is a refusal to make certain compromises 
either with capitalist politicians or labor bureaucracies, and a determination to follow through to the end the implications of the revolutionary Marxist orientation as expressed in Lenin's writings. This suggests that there was a decisive element of difference when all was said and done between the kind of party that Karl Kautsky was a member of in Germany, the Social Democratic Party, and the kind of party that Lenin and his comrades were actually building in Russia. At the same time, as Neil Harding, Lars Lee, August Nimtz, and others have emphasized, Lenin's thought can most fruitfully be understood in continuity with that of Marx. As the German reformist socialist, Edward Bernstein, once said to philosopher Sidney Hook, do you know, Marx had a strong Bolshevik streak. <laughs> Another key point is that Lenin's ideas and practical political efforts cannot adequately be comprehended outside of the context of his comrades and co-thinkers. It goes against the grain of Lenin's own method and against what actually happened in history to present Lenin not as one among a diverse collection of capable comrades, but as the one authoritative representative of true Marxism. While one can make a strong case that Lenin was the first among equals, it is quite simply wrong to be dismissive of his comrades as a collection of yes men and yes women, or as an inadequate bunch who never, never measured up. A problem of many of us in the Trotskyist tradition, and I consider myself a Trotskyist, problem with many of us in the Trotskyist tradition is a tendency to view other prominent Bolsheviks simply as bunglers. They got it wrong, they misunderstood, they failed to remain true to the brilliance of their would-be mentor. To think that a revolution can really be understood in that way, and to think that an effective revolutionary organization can be built according to such a model is highly problematical. Two of the favorite whipping boys for those wishing to elevate Lenin above his followers are Gregory Zinoviev and Lev Kamenev. Lars Lee has had the distinction of being in the vanguard of those inclined to push back against the dismissal of these two close comrades of Lenin. His defense of, by the way, with Zinoviev, uh, I can make, we can make, we can construct serious criticisms you know, taken from those who work with uh, Zinoviev in the Bolshevik movement and the Communist International. But still, uh, Lars's defense of Zinoviev is, is worth looking at. It's presented in a volume edited with Ben Lewis, Zinoviev and Martov, Head to Head in Holly, where, hardly uncritical of Zinoviev, he says, two comments by prominent Bolshevik Anatoly Lunacharsky seem to me to hit the right note. He called Zinoviev a person who had a profound understanding of the essence of Bolshevism, and one who was romantically devoted to the party, adding that Zinoviev was someone who was under the spell of the Leninist drama of proletarian hegemony, but with a decidedly populist bent. Okay, that's what Lars is saying about Zinoviev. Lars has also taken up the cudgels on behalf of Lev Kamenev, the target of Lenin's critique of a presumably ossified old Bolshevism in 1917. And actually, he presented uh, a, uh, well, I'll, I'll tell you what he did. A couple of years back, he offered a provocative, one of his many provocative essays uh, entitled The Ironic Triumph of Old Bolshevism, the Debates of April 1917 in Context in a scholarly journal, Russian History. Lars challenges the standard account of Lenin reorienting the Bolshevik party in preparation for the October Revolution, writing that Kamenev seems to think he won the debate with Lenin in April 1917, and Lars suggests that Kamenev was right. One need not re agree with this reinterpretation of April 1917's debate in order to appreciate Kamenev's positive contribution and Lars's positive contribution. Um, I am more drawn to the interpretations of Lenin provided in the memoirs of an eyewitness. 
Lenin's close comrade and devoted companion, Nadezhda Krupskaya, a shrewd revolutionary in her own right. When she deals with this debate that, this, uh, that uh, Lars is raising a controversy about, I think she's right and Lars is wrong. So this is what she does. Uh, she quotes uh, uh, Lenin in her reminiscences. You should read The Reminiscences of Lenin by Krupskaya. It's a wonderful book for revolutionaries. Um, and Lenin uh, says in early 1917, she quotes him, without a doubt, this coming revolution can only be a proletarian revolution, and in an even more profound sense of the word, a proletarian socialist revolution. This coming revolution will show in an even greater degree, on the one hand, that only grim battles, only civil wars can free humanity from the yoke of capital. On the other hand, that only the class conscious proletarians can and will give leadership to the vast majority of the exploited. That is Lenin's point of view going into Russia in April 1917. Krupskaya described the presentation of the April theses that he gave in this way. Lenin expounded his views as to what had to be done in a number of theses. In these theses, he weighed the situation and clearly set forth the aims that had to be striven for and the ways that had to be followed to attain them, like in the quote that, I just, uh, that she uh, provides. The comrades were somewhat taken aback for the moment. Many of them thought that Ilyich was presenting the case in too blunt a manner and that it was too early yet to speak of a socialist revolution. She notes that Lenin's theses were published in the Bolshevik paper Pravda, followed by a polemic from Kamenev, in which he disassociated himself from these theses. Kamenev's article stated that they were the expression of Lenin's personal views, which neither Pravda nor the Bureau of the Central Committee shared. It was not these theses of Lenin's that the Bolshevik de delegates had accepted, but those of the Central Committee Bureau, Kamenev alleged. Krupskaya concluded, a struggle started within the Bolshevik organization. It did not last long. Within a week, Lenin's position was upheld by the Bolshevik majority. This account is similar to what one finds in the accounts of other eyewitnesses, the Mensheviks, Nikolai Shukhanov and Rafael Abramovich, the Menshevik turned Bolshevik, Alexandra Kolontai, and the Bolshevik turned Menshevik, W.S. Wojtynski. There was a lot of fluidity in the revolutionary movement back then. <laughs> there are three extremely important facts that emerge, however, in Lars Lee's account, even if you don't agree with part of the thrust of what he's saying. First of all, Lenin did not feel bound by some rigid notion of democratic centralism to refrain from expressing his own views if they happen to be in contradiction to those of the formal leadership of the Revolutionary Party to which he belonged. For Lenin, revolutionary principles always trump, always trump organizational harmony. And this was an essential element to his conception of democratic centralism and revolutionary organization. Second, an open debate between comrades in the pages of the party newspaper was by no means alien to the Leninism of the early Bolsheviks. In a recent article, Lars quotes from a 1925 history of the Bolshevik party written by a veteran Bolshevik organizer, Vladimir Nevsky, who tells us that democratic centralism represented complete democracy, explaining that in 1917, the organization of the Bolsheviks lived fully the life of a genuine proletarian democratic organization with free discussion, lively exchange of opinions taking place uh, in the absence of any bureaucratic attitude to getting things done. In a word, the active participation emphatically of all members in the affairs of the organization. Third, is that the old Bolshevism that Kamenev defended had been a collectively developed orientation, the common position of Lenin and the Bolshevik comrades with whom he now disagreed. Both the Bolshevik and Menshevik wings of Russian socialism had seen Russia's revolution as a bourgeois democratic revolution preliminary to the future transition to socialism. 
But in 1917, no less than before, the politics of all Bolsheviks was grounded in a militantly class struggle orientation distinct from the worker capitalist alliance position of the Mensheviks, projecting an uncompromising worker peasant alliance. This common ground between old Bolshevism and the April Theses, rooted in the collectively developed politics over a period of years, that, not the blinding revolutionary authority of the unquestioned leader, is what made it relatively easy for Lenin to win the debate so quickly in 1917. There's another aspect of Leninism often raised as a truly negative feature to be avoided by serious activists today. This is the extremely intolerant sectarianism purported to be at the very heart of the communist international that Lenin and his comrades established, of which Gregory Zinoviev was the president from 1919 to 1926. Sometimes critics of the form of Lenin that uh, Leninism took in this period denounce it as Zinovievism. Some of what is being denounced, however, can more fairly be laid at Lenin's door, in particular at the 21 conditions for affiliation to the Communist International. Adopted at the 1920 Second Congress of the Comintern, this document began with an important explanation. The initial popularity of the Russian Revolution and the Communist International among radicalizing workers of various countries attracted some parties that were not actually in agreement with the revolutionary Marxist program of the New International, particularly some still led by reformist or semi-reformist leaders closely associated with the Second International. This meant that the common turn, quote, is in danger of being diluted by vacillating and irresolute groups that have not yet broken from the ideology of the Second International." End of quote. This ideology had led to a general capitulation to the imperialist slaughter of World War I and the suppression of revolutionaries within the various organizations. The incredibly strict conditions designed to prevent the possibility of such reformist dilution explicitly excluded any consideration of membership in the common turn for well-known reformist socialists, insisting that communist principles and organizational perspectives be strictly adhered to, with no organizational ties to the parties and trade unions associated with the Second International being permitted. Very strict, very rigid sounding stuff. And this has been utilized by some critics to dismiss Lenin and the common turn as authoritarian and destructive. Such an ahistorical approach, however, not only ignores the historically specific context that caused the adoption of the 21 points, but also urges us to dismiss the efforts of countless revolutionaries who made the early communist international a living reality a serious examination of the immense multi-volume work on that entity by John Rydell and his colleagues, which includes considerable contributions on overcoming sectarianism, building united fronts, and so on, suggests the shallowness of this approach of rejection. This is not to insist that all aspects of the 21 conditions must be accepted or that any of them are beyond criticism. In order to begin a serious critique, however, it also makes sense to take seriously the reasons given for their adoption, reasons which at that particular moment in history may have had greater validity than some critics allow. This brings us to a final point. We are incredibly far from the specific realities of the Communist International or of the Socialist International or even of Karl Marx's International Working Men's Association. In some ways, they were far ahead of any of these. Or, I'm sorry, in some ways we are far ahead of those first three internationals. But in important ways, socialists from these first three workers' internationals were far in advance of us. There is much to learn from the Leninist tradition 
but one must use it critically and creatively to make sense in our own political context and time period. And that, what I've just said, happens to be central to the method of Lenin. I'll now turn, I've been talking history here, mapping out some history, what actually happened in history. And some of it may be useful for us, but I want to concentrate now in the second half of my remarks on uh, thoughts as to how we can utilize and contribute to the Leninist tradition as we struggle for socialism in the 21st century. I gave a presentation about as long as this one uh, in London last year on my thoughts regarding what I think it will take to engage fruitfully in the process of building a revolutionary party in the United States. What I said then still makes sense to me, but one of the comrades there made an excellent criticism. My comments involved an immersion in the specific realities in the United States. And I still think that what we do in the United States must be grounded in local actualities and national specifics that we're part of. The same is true for you in Australia. But she pointed out that the international dimension was largely missing from what I had to say, and I had to agree with her that this was a serious weakness. There were references to opposing war and imperialism, but that was about it. For serious Marxists, however, internationalism has always involved more than that, and it has involved much more than simply rhetorical solidarity with the struggles of workers and oppressed of all lands. It especially means grounding our nationally specific politics in an understanding of what is happening with capitalism as a global system and in creative interaction with sisters and brothers fighting against oppression and for economic justice throughout the world. Struggles and gains and setbacks in one place impact on struggles in other places. Important lessons learned here can provide incredibly useful lessons elsewhere. Experiences of those who struggle in other lands can only, not only inspire us, but also provide invaluable insights about what we might do next in our own contexts. That was true in the time of Lenin, as reflected, for example, in the amazing multi-volume retrieval of material on the early communist international, I've referred to it already, that John Rydell and his co-workers have been making available to us. That's an amazing resource that we need to delve into again and again. If anything, what I've just said is even more true in our much vaunted age of globalization, in which working class organizing and solidarity across borders will undoubtedly provide the key to winning strategies in both our short-term and long-term efforts to push back capitalist tyranny and finally to end it. Australian revolutionaries have been making cutting-edge contributions to the development of such internationalism through conferences like this that you're sharing with the whole world and especially through the outstanding service provided uh, online with links, the International Journal of Socialist Retrieval. The World Social Forum, at least in its earlier years, was also part of this global radicalization process. Vital contributions have also come from the dramatic proliferation of worldwide information sharing and communication through the internet. Serious revolutionary groups in all countries, it seems to me, need to find ways to advance such virtual and face-to-face engagement to strengthen the cooperative process of advancing our interrelated liberation struggles. Revolutionary internationalism must be more than a slogan. It should involve a collaboration and activities that are part of our efforts in each country. Many revolutionaries are faced with the challenge of how small socialist groups can give way to mass socialist parties and movements. Have you ever considered that yourselves? <laughs> no. no? Uh, you, you should think about it, comrades. Give it some thought. <laughs> a number of us have concluded that it is a fatal mistake for a small group to see itself as the nucleus or embryo 
of a mass revolutionary party. Such a party will in fact be made up through the coming together of elements from a number of groups, as well as a number of people not presently in any group, and even more who do not presently think of themselves as socialists at all. It will crystallize through innumerable experiences and struggles, blending together with a broad labor radical subculture of ideas, discussions, and creative activities. The creation of a genuine revolutionary party consistent with Lenin's own orientation can only come about on the basis of a substantial portion of a broad class conscious vanguard layer of the working class. One of our primary jobs as revolutionary socialists is to do all that we can through mass struggles, through socialist education, through working with others to contribute to the crystallization of such a vanguard layer, a layer that will be the basis of the revolutionary party. It is obviously important for existing small groups of socialists to work together as much as they can to advance this process, a process that will cause them to go out of existence by merging into the larger revolutionary party to be. Sometimes it's hard to do that, to work to put yourself out of existence, but that's what we've got to do. Sometimes there is such a substantial overlap in the basic principles of the different groups that it makes sense for them to become a single larger group as they work to help create the preconditions for a genuine mass revolutionary party. The coming together of the groups is not the creation of the revolutionary party. It's the strengthening of the force that can be doing the work to help create the preconditions for that party. Sometimes there are obstacles that make such fusions unlikely or impossible. There may be fundamental disagreements about the process or desirability of creating a mass revolutionary party. There may be fundamental disagreements on how to relate to capitalist political forces. There may be fundamental disagreements around the relation of democracy to socialism. Such fundamental disagreements might mean that organizational unity is not in the cards. But there could still be the basis for and the desirability of what Lenin once called fighting unity. Not <laughs> unity where you're fighting with each other, but a uh, fighting <laughs> unity. And what sometimes uh, is referred to us uh, by us as uh, united fronts. In the midst of the 1905 revolutionary upsurge in Russia, Lenin argued against a call for all the different revolutionary groups to submerge their differences and unite in a single group. In the interests of the revolution, he wrote, our ideal should by no means be that all parties, all trends, and all shades of opinion fuse into a revolutionary chaos. He referred to other hasty and half-baked experiments in such unity, seeking to lump together the most heterogeneous elements, which achieved little more than mutual friction and bitter disappointment. Have you ever been there? <laughs> Have you ever been in that kind of situation or seen something like that? Too often, we don't need that. On the other hand, if diverse groups focus on how to advance a specific struggle around democratic rights or economic justice, agreeing to disagree on points of difference while cooperating to achieve a meaningful immediate aim, much can be achieved. As long as fundamental differences exist, Lenin insisted, we shall inevitably have to march separately, but we can strike together more than once and particularly now amid the revolutionary insurgency. History also shows us that the, uh, to the extent that practical experience eliminates fundamental differences, it becomes possible for different forces to come together into a single organization with very positive results. This was the case at certain points in revolutionary Russia and in many other instances. It appears that circumstances in Australia today may be contributing to some groups going beyond simply a fighting unity 
toward the achievement of an organizational unity that could greatly strengthen the efforts of revolutionary socialists. This experience, this possibility, it's very exciting. It is being watched and it will provide invaluable lessons for revolutionaries not only here but in other countries. Related to this, it is worth noting another essential element in Lenin's methodology. The way he combined an insistence on the clarity of basic principles, those of revolutionary Marxism, with what might be called a principled flexibility. A number of people, including severe critics among the Mensheviks who knew him well, were struck by his extreme disinclination to make a show of his own knowledge and by his deep desire to learn from others, especially fellow revolutionary activists, workers, peasants. He understood that one must be able to listen and learn from those who one hopes to teach, and that the development of knowledge is interactive and collective. He even learned from political opponents. I mean, I'm not talking about political opponents within the socialist movement. He learned from uh, the British liberal, J.A. Hobson, who powerfully influenced his book on imperialism, The Highest Stage of Capitalism. He learned from anarchists who influenced his classic, The State and Revolution. He learned from the populists of the Socialist Revolutionary Party. They influenced him enough to cause him to steal their agrarian program of land to the peasants. And during the revolutionary upsurge of 1905, he scolded some Bolshevik comrades who were more drawn to revolutionary rhetoric than to practical worker struggles, saying, direct quote, take a lesson from the Mensheviks for Christ's sakes. <laughs> In more than one way, Lenin's theoretical approach was not a closed system, but rather what can be called an open Marxism. He called it a guide to action, emphasizing that reality is always much more complex, vibrant, and multicolored than theory can ever be. And the theory must continually be developed and renewed through the engagement with actual political struggle and experience. That is the kind of Marxism we need in order to comprehend the rapidly evolving capitalism of our time and the multifaceted and fluid realities of working class life and experience. This involves the dramatic shifts and fluctuations in regard to working class occupations and the labor process. The proletarianization of large swaths of the labor force not traditionally perceived as working class. It involves the interplay of class with ethnicity, race, gender, religion, culture, and more. Lenin's approach helps to orient us to the amazing dynamics of globalization and to understand that issues often perceived as identity politics are inseparable from class politics. This, is, uh, this uh, comes through in the famous passage in What is to be Done, which is worth reminding ourselves of again and again. One of my favorite Lenin quotes. The social democrats' ideal should not be the trade union secretary but the tribune of the people who is able to react to every manifestation of tyranny and oppression, no matter where it appears, no matter what stratum or class of people it affects, who is able to generalize all these manifestations and produce a single picture of police violence and capitalist exploitation, who is able to take advantage of every event, however small, in order to set before uh, all his socialist convictions and his democratic demands in order to clarify for all that every, and to all and everyone the world historic significance of the struggle for the emancipation of the proletariat. This remains as true now as it was a hundred years ago. It also dovetails with the centrality of democracy to the working class struggle for socialism that Lenin was emphasizing two years before the Bolshevik Revolution. It is also worth quoting at length because it helps to define what we must be doing today in the struggle for socialism in our own century. Here's the quote. The proletariat cannot be victorious except through democracy, that is by giving full effect to democracy and by linking with each step of its struggle democratic demands formulated in the most resolute terms. 
we must combine the revolutionary struggle against capitalism with a revolutionary program and tactics on all democratic demands. A republic, a militia, the popular election of officials, equal rights for women, the determination, uh, self-determination of nations, etc. While capitalism exists, these demands, all of them, can only be accomplished as an exception, and even then, in an incomplete and distorted form. Basing ourselves on the democracy already achieved and exposing its incompleteness under capitalism, we demand the overthrow of capitalism and the expropriation of the bourgeoisie as a necessary basis both for the abolition of the poverty of the masses and for the complete and all-round institution of all democratic reforms. Some of these reforms will be started before the overthrow of the bourgeoisie. And in the course of that overthrow, and still others after it, the social revolution is not a single battle, but a period covering a series of battles over all sorts of problems of economic and democratic reform, which are consummated only by the expropriation of the bourgeoisie. It is for the sake of this final aim that we must formulate every one of our democratic demands in a consistently revolutionary way. It is quite conceivable that the workers of some particular country will overthrow the bourgeoisie before even a single fundamental democratic reform has been fully achieved. It is, however, quite inconceivable that the proletariat as an historical class will be able to defeat the bourgeoisie unless it is prepared for that by being educated in the spirit of the most consistent and resolutely revolutionary democracy. That's the Lenin quote. The centrality of democracy in the struggle for socialism applies not only in the social and political struggles within society, but also in the internal structure and practice of the socialist organization itself. In my book, Lenin and the Revolutionary Party, and in other places, I have written a great deal on the actual meaning and practice of the concept democratic centralism what Lenin defined as full freedom of discussion and unity in action. And others have written about this as well. It has been documented that the Bolshevik organization had a considerable degree of internal democracy. We've already noted here how this changed dramatically under the rule of Joseph Stalin. That was a disastrous development, largely rooted in the devastation and isolation of Soviet Russia in the midst of the Civil War years combined with the extreme economic backwardness and poverty of the Russian economy. This resulted in what were supposed to be emergency measures that in fact became permanent, which eliminated any genuine democracy in the Soviet Union and also eliminated genuine internal democracy in all communist parties controlled by the Stalin leadership. What we have found even among all too many anti-Stalinist organizations committed to revolutionary socialism are, in the name of Leninism and democratic centralism, practices that cut across the possibility of the kind of internal democracy that seems to have existed historically in Lenin's organization. Such internal democracy is one feature that made it possible for the Bolsheviks to be the kind of revolutionary force that triumphed in 1917. One of the reasons for the disappointing absence of that kind of democracy in some many relatively small socialist groups in later years may have to do with a flaw in their self-conception. Some function more or less as sects, creating their own political universe that involves a self-conception that they constitute the revolutionary vanguard or the politically correct nucleus around which such a vanguard must form. The hope for the future is often seen as preserving the authority and ideological purity of one's precious organization. This can engender ideological and organizational rigidities, which distort the way that democratic centralism, particularly full freedom of discussion, might be understood and practiced. If our self-conception is that we do not yet have a revolutionary party, not even in embryo, 
and that our purpose is to create the preconditions that might make the emergence of such a party possible. This could encourage a different kind of internal practice, in some ways matching the way we would be dealing with those outside of our own group. A primary goal would be to generate more and more thought, experience, and creativity among one's comrades and others, as activists who are working together to bring into being a force that can successfully challenge capitalism. There are indications, in fact, that such an extended pre-party process, even in underground conditions, existed through the 1890s and the early 1900s among Marxist-oriented revolutionaries, creating a subculture which nurtured a genuine internal democracy as the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party and its Bolshevik faction finally took shape. One of the revolutionaries in the making from that time woman named Eugenia, Eugenia Levitskaya, later reminisced, turning over in my mind the mass of comrades with whom I had occasion to meet, I cannot recall a single reprehensible, contemptible act, a single deception or lie. There was friction. There were factional differences of opinion, but no more than that. Somehow everyone looked after himself morally became better and more gentle in that friendly family. This sense of things can be found in a different context many years later, when the veteran revolutionary James P. Cannon commented, the true art of being a socialist consists in anticipating the socialist future, in not waiting for its actual realization, but in striving here and now, insofar as the circumstances of class society permit, to live like a socialist, to live under capitalism according to the higher standards of a socialist future. A vibrant elaboration of this comradely subculture among Russian revolutionaries comes through in Maxim Gorky's novel uh, of 1906, Mother. A central figure in this subculture, Lenin, wrote in What is to be Done about the organizational ideal of 1902 as a close and compact body of comrades in which complete mutual confidence prevails. Even amid the fierce polemical controversies among Russian communists in 1920, Lenin quoted Trotsky, with whom he was then in sharp disagreement, that ideological struggle within the party does not mean mutual ostracism, but mutual influence. It's the kind of discussion I heard this morning, frankly. One of the most important elements in this subculture, I think, should be an inclusiveness that persistently and insistently works to overcome in the revolutionary organization the divisive oppressions of racism, sexism, heterosexism, and other destructive dynamics blighting human relationships in the larger society. At times, this may generate painful tensions and conflicts scrupulously democratic process combined with considerable thoughtfulness and sensitivity will be needed to help maintain balance and cohesion as the organization works frankly and seriously toward fruitful results. Such a general subculture contributes to the realization of a primary task for any, worth, any revolutionary organization worth its salt. The development of durable cadres I heard it pronounced as cotters by some of you, or something like that. I pronounce it cadres. Uh, by this term cadre, or however you want to pronounce it, <laughs> I am referring to experienced activists, educated in political theory, analytically oriented, with practical organizational skills, who are able to attract new and train new members of the revolutionary organization, and also to contribute to expanding efforts in broader movements for social change. This means knowing something of the history of the class struggle and of broad liberation struggles, knowing the economic and political realities of our society, knowing how to size up a situation, knowing how to interact with others to help communicate that knowledge to them, knowing how to organize meetings and political actions. Such qualities need to be developed among increasing numbers of people, the proliferation 
of durable cadres is essential for all the life-giving struggles leading up to the possibility of socialist revolution. Lenin's thought, as Marxist philosopher George Lukash emphasized nine decades back, was influenced by a sense of the actuality of revolution which would be essential in establishing, as Lukash put it, firm guidelines for all questions on the daily agenda, whether they were political or economic, involved theory or tactics, agitation uh, or uh, organization. That is to say, Lenin was concerned in all his political thinking and activity with the question of what would it take, actually, to take power? What would it take to take power? Not rhetorically, not theoretically, but in fact, and then to do exactly that. Our purpose as revolutionary socialists is not simply to persuade people that socialism could be so much better than capitalism. Our purpose is not simply to protest and organize protests against capitalist injustice. Our purpose is not simply to organize struggles to bring about improvements under capitalism. I mean, we should be doing all of this, but that is not that is not the purpose. Our purpose is not simply to interpret history and current events or anything else from a revolutionary st uh, socialist standpoint. Instead, our primary purpose is to overturn existing power relations and to put political power into the hands of the working class majority. That is our primary purpose. Everything else should be working to bring that about, that actuality of revolution. I want to conclude with two, I want to conclude, you ready for me to conclude? Boy, I am, I am thirsty, I want some water here. So I want to conclude, but I can't yet, I have to say two more things. I want to conclude with two additional notions on what may need to be done by a revolutionary party that actually intends to implement the revolutionary democratic approach for bringing about socialism that we saw Lenin laying out in that long quotation about democratic struggles that I offered a few moments ago. One notion has to do with ways that practical struggles in the here and now can be integrated into a strategy for the working class to take power. The other notion involves defining a bit more specifically what the socialism we are struggling for would actually look like in order to help guide the practical struggles of today and tomorrow. The old Bolshevik strategic orientation that Lenin developed with his comrades involved the notion that a worker-peasant alliance would bring about the democratic revolution that would overthrow the monarchist oppression and clear the way for the effect of struggle for socialism. That was the strategic orientation. This was popularized into political agitation and mobilization around three demands. An eight-hour workday for the workers, land redistribution for the peasants, and a constituent assembly to establish a democratic republic. These came to be known as the three whales of Bolshevism. Whales, like that big fish-like uh, mammal. The three whales of Bolshevism, that was based on the popular Russian folktale that the world is balanced on the backs of three whales. What are the three whales of your own revolutionary perspective in Australia and ours in the United States? What is the strategic orientation that could bring the working class to power in society today? And how can this be expressed in popular and practical struggles in the here and now, in a way that can capture the imaginations of masses of people. Finding answers to such questions is a challenge facing revolutionary socialists of each and every country in the 21st century. Other guidelines for the practical struggles of today and tomorrow need to be provided by the question of what the socialism we are struggling for would actually look like it has become a tradition for Marxists to scoff proudly and indignantly that we cannot provide utopian blueprints of the future society. And there's a validity to this. But it seems to me that present day realities are eroding that validity. 
For decades, we have been treated to the spectacle of parties claiming to be socialist, coming to power, or at least being voted into office, and then, in contradiction to their stated goals, carrying out so-called realistic policies designed to salvage and maintain one or another version of actually existing capitalism. In some cases, this is combined with implementing welfare state social reforms. In other cases, it is combined with slashing previously implemented welfare state reforms. Do we intend to do better than that? Yeah. Yeah, hell yeah. <laughs> if so, we need to figure out how and be able to explain that to those whose mass support will be needed to make it so. And then that has to be integrated into our strategy, that we're mobile, it has to be maybe integrated into our three whales. If there is an alternative to the present impasse of capitalism and to capitalism itself, we need to be able to say quite specifically what that would look like, with at least some key specifics, how it would be done. It would involve a society free from poverty and unemployment, with decent education and health care and housing for all, with a secure economic infrastructure, including like in the case of Pittsburgh where we're fighting for it, mass transit, and the elimination of air and water pollution and of the destructive use of our natural resources. It would involve liberty and justice for all, like it says in the Pledge of Allegiance to the American flag, liberty and justice for all, with the free development of each person being the condition for the free development of all. That's in some other document I read somewhere. <laughs> This would involve an economic democracy to ensure that e society's economic resources would be utilized to make these proposed changes a reality. Such things can be explained in ways that highlight how they can actually be carried out based on real world specifics. This can in turn provide the basis for immediate struggles, struggles whose beginning is in our present day capitalist society, but whose end would take us beyond that framework to the future genuine democracy and freedom. The socialism that we want can be embedded in the struggles of today and the victories of tomorrow. Some see this approach that I'm talking about as being somewhat akin to Leon Trotsky's transitional program. Although in the Communist Manifesto, Marx and Engels seem to have sketched a similar approach. They suggest, here's a quote, in the beginning, this cannot be affected except by means of despotic inroads in the rights of property and on the conditions of bourgeois production. By means of measures, therefore, which appear economically insufficient and untenable, but which in the course of the movement outstrip themselves, necessitate further inroads upon the old social order, and are unavoidable as means of entirely revolutionizing the mode of production. That's okay as far as it goes. It's way too abstract. How does that get translated into our own reality? That's our responsibility to figure out and then do it. The challenge for us is to get increasingly specific and practical about the socialist alternative to capitalism. Building organizations and movements that can develop mass consciousness and mass struggles capable of bringing about that alternative. That's the point of what we're doing. The actuality of revolution, the culmination of what so many of us, so many of our brothers and sisters have been struggling for over so many years, a socialist future to be created in the 21st century. So now I'm looking forward to sitting down, having some water, and participating in the discussion. Thank you very much.